Chapter 1 The M5 motorway on a Friday afternoon in August was enough to drive you mad. It took Craig 40 minutes just to get out of the city. Then the traffic would be nose to tail all the way from Birmingham to Taunton. Stop start. Stop start. A slow crawl that had him drumming his fingers on the steering wheel. Craig looked longingly at the hard shoulder. It was so tempting. If he got stopped, he could just flash his badge. He'd probably get away with it, except he wasn't that sort of copper. He didn't abuse his position. He had mates who had no problem with doing that kind of thing, breaking the rules, but Craig liked to stick to the letter of the law. He always played it straight, even if it wasn't always the easy option. He could feel his t-shirt sticking to the back of his seat. He wasn't going to be a pretty sight by the time he got to the beach at Everton, nor a pretty smell. The aircon didn't seem to make any difference, and opening the windows didn't help. He took a swig from the bottle of water he'd stuffed in the cup holder. It was warm, but it took the edge off the dryness in his throat. He wiped his brow with the back of his arm and looked at the sweat. Gross. After Taunton, the traffic cleared and he put his foot down, keeping at a steady 70 miles an hour until he turned off the motorway. The car headed over Rexmoor, its high, bleak landscape parched and brown from the summer sun. Away from the traffic Craig started to relax. He had a whole week off. A whole week to do what he liked. All he had with him was a few clothes, a wetsuit and his surfboard. And the key to the beach hut. There were eight of them from the police station who'd clubbed together to rent the hut. Young people who were all into beach life and loved surfing, rock climbing, walking and kayaking. It was cheaper than going on holiday. It took just over three hours to get there, if you put your foot down. So between them they made the most of it. Craig was the only one going down this weekend. All the others had different plans. After all the stress he'd had lately, he was looking forward to the peace and quiet. He couldn't wait to get there. As he drove past the last supermarket before Everdeen, he decided to pull over and pick up some food so he wouldn't have to venture out for a day or so. He bought a hot chicken and some rolls, a bag of salad, fruit, biscuits, some beers and bottled water. By six o'clock he would be sitting on the step sipping a beer and looking at the sea. As he left the car park, he turned up the radio, grinned from ear to ear and gave a whoop. Let the weekend begin. Chapter 2 Gina ran a damp cloth over the counter of her ice cream kiosk for the tenth time that afternoon. She liked to keep it spotless. Behind her the radio was blaring, and above her the sun was shining in the sky. 
she adjusted the cones waiting to be filled, smoothed out the surfaces of the tubs and washed her scoops again. She looked down at the cabinet, pleased with the way it looked. Inside there was a rainbow of ice creams to choose from. There were the usual, of course, chocolate and strawberry and vanilla. Then there were the more exotic flavors. Maple and walnut, rhubarb and ginger, Mississippi mud pie, peanut butter cluster. The one that most kids seemed to hanker after was bubble gum, bright blue and sickly sweet. Dream ices certainly didn't leave you short of choice. The kiosk was situated at the top of the row of shops that led down to the harbor. Takam had once been a thriving holiday resort, bursting at the seams with tourists. Now, in the recession, it was feeling the pinch. The hotels were closing down one after the other, as were the restaurants. Eventually the empty places got boarded up, then covered in graffiti, which didn't make the place very inviting. The fishing boats still came in and out of the harbor, but there was a rundown air to the seafront, which had once bustled with life. Now it was deserted most of the day, until evening when gangs of bored youths collected there with cans of lager. The coastline was spectacular with its craggy rocks and crashing waves, but the town itself had become gray. A handful of attractions remained, a merry-go-round circled on the front its horses in need of repainting. The arcade beeped and flashed with fruit machines. And Dream Ices sold 29 varieties of ice cream, which you could have in a waffle cone, or in a cone coated in sprinkles, or in a cone dipped in chocolate. You could also have chocolate, raspberry or butterscotch sauce on top. Then if you still wanted more, there were chocolate flakes and fingers of fudge and a squirt of whipped cream to finish. Twenty-nine flavors had always annoyed Jenna. She would have made it thirty, but one of the tubs was filled with water for washing the scoops. Three rows, two of ten and one of nine, of brightly colored, mouth-watering ice cream. She had noticed over the past week that some of the tubs were nearly empty and hadn't been replaced. Usually they were filled up before you could see the white plastic at the bottom. They'd almost run out of rum and raisin and mint chocolate chip, and Devon clotted cream fudge. There wasn't any in the freezer, which was strange. When she mentioned it to her boss, Terry, he just nodded and said he'd get onto it. Dream Isis had done okay. Even though times were hard, it seemed like people still had money for an ice. There were just enough day trippers to keep the place ticking over. Sometimes Jenna scooped away all afternoon. All the same, she should have sensed trouble coming. For some reason, she hadn't. So when the owner of Dream Ices, Terry, came up to her on Friday afternoon, Jenna hadn't expected to be sacked. I've got some bad news, love, 
he said. I was hoping this wasn't going to happen but times are hard. I'm going to have to let you go. Her eyes widened in shock. You're not closing down, surely? Number. Not yet. He looked gloomy, as if this might happen. But I can't afford to keep you on. I'll have to run the place myself. She wasn't sure how he was going to manage that. Terry spent most of his time in the pub or at the bookies. Maybe that explained why he was in difficulty. Things will pick up, she said hopefully. We've been busy today. And the forecast for the weekend is great. Nearly 30 degrees, they reckon. Terry was always moaning that the glory days were over. He was always telling her about the life he used to have, when the town was in its heyday and his pockets were stuffed with cash. He shook his head. Even if we doubled the takings in the next month, I can't afford you. I'm sorry. Surely we've done all right this summer? She asked. I've been rushed off my feet some days. He shook his head. Not like the old days. I could clear 500 quid cash, no problem, on a bank holiday. I struggle to get that in a week now. And the rent's gone up. And the wholesalers have put their prices up. Jenna didn't know what to say. Terry looked out to sea and cleared his throat. I can't give you your wages, either. Jenna's heart skipped a beat. He owed her over two weeks' money. You're kidding me. I haven't got it. I had to pay the supplier. There was nothing left. There had been enough for him to have a few pints at lunchtime. She could smell the beer on his breath. I'll bring it round when I get it, he promised her. If we have a good weekend, she'd never see it. She knew that. You could have told me before, Jenna told him. You must have known you couldn't pay me, but you let me carry on working. No, he said. I promise you. I was hoping for something to happen. I was hoping. For a win on the horses? Terry gave something between a shrug and a nod. Jenna felt hot with fury. Gambling is a game for mugs. Surely you know that by now, Terry? If it was that easy, everyone would be doing it. Terry just walked away and stood by the harbor railings. He lit a cigarette. Jenna couldn't believe what Terry had done. She had been so loyal to him. She'd kept the place afloat all summer, smiling and laughing with the customers. She talked them into having two scoops when they only wanted one. She persuaded women who were watching their figure that just one wouldn't hurt. And the locals came here to buy ice cream from her too. She'd become a bit of a local landmark over the summer. It was her banter rather than the ice cream that they came for. 
and her singing. She'd started off singing along to songs on the radio, using a cone as a microphone. Then she started singing whatever she felt like, her own favorites that she could belt out behind the counter. It kept her sane even if she didn't look mad, but people seemed to enjoy it. Her mood was catching. She was known as the ice cream girl. She didn't mind being called that at all. It was a happy name. People had started making requests. They were always telling her she should go on the X Factor, or get an agent, or join a band. But Jenna knew there was a big difference between mucking about and doing it for real. She wasn't convinced she had any real talent. She just wanted people to have a good time. She wasn't going to be the ice cream girl anymore, though. In the past two minutes she had been turned back into a nobody. That would teach her to have trusted Terry, and to have done her best for him. She had genuinely thought he would look after her and see her right, but number. As soon as things got tough he had dumped her. He was just like everybody else. Out for himself and what he could get. She felt tears pricking the back of her eyelids, but she refused to cry. Terry Rowe wasn't going to see the effect he'd had on her. She took off her apron and folded it up carefully. Then she picked up the strawberry sauce and squirted it all over every tub of ice cream in the cabinet. She followed it with the chocolate. Then she sprinkled a shaker full of hundreds and thousands over the lot. She felt sick with anger. She remembered the number of times Terry had wrong her, begging her to do a shift because he'd had a skin full. The days she'd stayed late because he couldn't drag himself out of the pub. He had repaid her loyalty by sacking her the minute things got tough. He came back when he had finished his cigarette. She could smell the tobacco on him and it turned her stomach. What have you done? He asked, outraged. She shrugged. You can pay me back for all of that. There's a couple of hundred quids worth there. Take it out of my wages, she told him. It hadn't been a dream job. No one dreamed about selling ice cream the way they did being an actress or a supermodel or a singer. She'd enjoyed it, though. Ice cream brought a few moments of pleasure. She loved watching people's faces as they looked at what was on offer. Dazzled by the choice. She loved their smiles as they took their loaded cones. There were worse jobs. She walked away from the kiosk without looking back or bothering to say goodbye. By the time Gina got to the end of the key, her anger had turned to fear. She felt anxious. So anxious that it felt like her insides were being eaten. It was turning out to be a bad summer. Three weeks ago, someone had broken into the house where she had a room. 
They'd smashed in all the doors and taken everything they could. Jenna didn't have much in the way of valuables. But she had had three weeks worth of wages tucked into the back of a drawer, waiting to pay the rent. Her landlord hadn't been at all understanding. He reckoned it wasn't his fault the house had been burgled, even though everyone said the locks hadn't been strong enough. He'd agreed to wait for the rent until Jenna got her next lot of wages, which should have been today. How was she going to pay now? Her landlord was going to kick up, she knew he was. He wouldn't be interested in reasons or excuses. She'd promised him the rent she owed in cash by the end of the week, which was today. Friday. Otherwise he was going to boot her out. She knew he would. He knew people who would come and pack up her stuff and throw it out of her room, then drag her out afterwards. She'd seen it happen before. It didn't matter where she stood legally. People like her landlord didn't take any notice of the law. They knew the system wouldn't look after her. She was a nothing, a nobody, and no one cared. Jenna trudged into the center of Talkum, past the chip shop and the arcade and back to her house. She'd never call it home. Home was somewhere you were glad to come back to. Somewhere you felt you belonged. She was yet to feel that about anywhere. Chapter 3 The last five miles of Craig's journey were along a winding road lined with hedges. On either side the fields were full of sheep and cows. At last he reached the roundabout that led down the hill to Everton. After another half a mile and then, around the next corner, was the sight that lifted his heart every time he saw it. The sea. Endless and blue, yet never quite the same color. That first glimpse was always a thrill. He could see the pinky brown of the beach, too which was more than a mile of soft, soft sand. Then when he got closer, he spied the candy colors of the beach huts lined up in a row. The one that he shared with his copper mates was the seventh one along. Pale blue and white and in need of a lick of paint, but they never complained. Who cared about the state of the pain at work when there was fun to be had? He left his car in the public car park, took his overnight bag and his shopping from the boot and headed off down the slipway next to a small arcade of shops. They were all just closing for the night but he had time to buy himself a bag of chips from the cafe. He sat outside and ate them, one by one. Craig usually ate healthily, but he always treated himself every time he came down here. He'd soon burn off the calories. He kicked off his shoes and made the last part of his journey barefoot. The heat of the day was still in the sand, although as he sank deeper it was cool beneath the surface. It was hard going with everything he had to carry, but at last he reached the seventh beach hut along, 
with its faded blue door. He pulled out the key and slid it into the padlock, unlocked it and stepped inside. It always smelled the same, of damp and wood and salt. He breathed in and his stomach did a flip. It was like coming home. This was the place in the world where he felt most happy. It was basic. Some of the huts on the beach had been done up like show homes, but this one had hardly been touched since it was put up over 30 years ago. It had four wooden bunks, a kitchen area with a couple of cupboards, a tiny sink and a color gas stove. There was also a makeshift shower and a toilet. It was furnished with a giant old settee that sagged in the middle and a rickety table with four wobbly chairs. The blokes who shared it made no effort to decorate the hut, but sometimes the girls tried to add a feminine touch. One had bought a set of matching spotted mugs, tired of the chipped and stained ones. Another had put up some surfing pictures, and another had strung up some fairy lights. They had an ancient ghetto blaster on which they played old cassettes. They had a competition to see who could dig out the most cheesy tape. Most nights the hut rocked to the sounds of Herb Alpert, Barry Manilow and Boney M. Tonight, though, it was going to be peaceful. Craig preferred quiet when he was on his own. He needed to be alone with his thoughts, because he knew he was going to have to make a tough decision this weekend. As he looked out across the shore, he felt the worries and tension of the past few weeks gradually start to ease. It was all very well knowing you were innocent, but that didn't always count for much, especially when it was your word against someone else's. And when the video evidence against you looked bad. You didn't have much of a chance. Craig knew he would never treat a police suspect with unnecessary violence. But he'd been set up by a gang of blokes with a grudge against him. He'd been responsible for arresting one of their mates who'd been sent down for a long stretch. As a result, they had stitched him up and had him accused of police brutality. He'd been suspended while there was an investigation. Craig had spent the entire three months leading up to his case convinced he was going to lose his job, or, maybe, even worse. In the end, Justice had been done and he had been found innocent, but the stress had taken its toll. He lived in fear of it happening again and now faced every day with dread. He was fine with his close friends, but felt awkward with other workmates he came into contact with. He could tell they were wary. Wondering if he had been guilty. After all, there was no smoke without fire. The whole episode had made him question what he was doing with his life. He'd been longing to escape back to Everton, so he could clear his head. Now that he was here, he felt more hopeful. As he sank into a deck chair outside the beach hut and looked at the view with a bottle of beer in his hand, the future didn't seem quite so bleak. 
Jenna finally arrived at the terraced house where she lived. She had a bed set on the third floor. She shared a bathroom and kitchen with six other people. Six other people who didn't know how to use a dishcloth or bleach, or even flush the toilet, sometimes. She ended up cleaning up herself, even though they were supposed to take turns. It was either that, or live in squalor. She tried to make her room as nice as she could, but it was difficult. The carpet was green with mold in the corners. The wallpaper was ancient and coming off the wall in clumps. The windows let the cold in through the cracks in winter and turned the place into a sauna in summer. She couldn't afford proper curtains, so she'd hung a pair of old sheets from the rail. On the walls, she'd stuck photos of her heroines, Marilyn Monroe and Dita Von Teese, both glamorous pin-up girls not afraid to show off their curves. She tried to copy their image. But it was hard to look the part when you barely had enough money to keep body and soul together. Still, she always tried to wear a dress, and lipstick, and put her hair up, and this look usually helped to lift her spirits. If things were going badly, and you sobbed about in jeans and no makeup, you were bound to feel bad about yourself. No amount of dressing up took away her fear, though. She sat in the middle of her bed. It would only be a matter of time before the landlord came knocking. She didn't have the money for her rent. Her stomach churned with dread. Where would she go if he kicked her out? She didn't think she could get any lower. She'd left her mom's house a year ago when their rose had got out of control. She'd thought she could stand on her own two feet. It was much harder than she thought. Jenna thought about phoning her mates and meeting them at the pub, then she remembered she wouldn't be able to afford a drink. She was penniless. Someone would buy her one, of course they would, but she didn't want to feel like a scrounger. She flopped back down onto the mattress. The room smelled stale. The air was almost too hot to breathe. Everyone was saying what a fantastic weekend it was going to be, with soaring temperatures and fun in the sun. There wasn't going to be any fun on the third floor of 21A Boscombe Terrace. It was after his second beer that Craig began to miss Michelle. He knew it would happen. The first drink relaxed you. By the second, your defenses were down and emotions started to kick in. It would take another two or three beers to blot out the feelings altogether, but Craig didn't want to get drunk. He was going to have to put up with how he felt. They'd gone out for five years, Craig and Michelle. It had been a very easy relationship with no drama. They enjoyed each other's company and liked the same things. Then six months ago she'd been offered the chance to run a hairdressing salon at a big glitzy hotel in Dubai. 
The salon she had run in Birmingham City Center was struggling. She'd had to let valued staff go. She'd cut back on the cleaning and the number of towels they used. She hated cutting corners but she had no choice. People just weren't spending the money anymore. They were going three months, even longer, without having their color done, or doing it themselves at home. She was worried that the shop was going to go under. Then the opportunity of a lifetime had come along. Craig had had no second thoughts. You have to take it, he told her. You hate your job at the moment. It's depressing. Dubai will be an awesome chance for you. Michelle and Craig were sensible enough to realize that their relationship wouldn't survive the separation. Neither of them wanted the pressure or the guilt of trying to maintain it in the long term. I don't want you to get out there and feel you can't have fun, Craig told her. And I don't want you to mope around because I'm not there, said Michelle. So they agreed to part, but as friends. He drove her to the airport. She hugged him tight at the departure gate, and cried a bit, but he could tell she was excited about her new life. They'd agreed he would go out there at Christmas if neither of them had found someone else. Neither of them had so far, but Craig didn't think he would go. Long-distance relationships never worked. He'd seen the pictures she'd posted on Facebook and it felt as if he was looking at a stranger. They went on Skype from time to time too, but he found it upsetting. It just reminded him of what he was missing. He'd been too caught up with the investigation to find anyone else. His mate sagged him on when they went to the pub in Everdeen for a drink. They thought he should find someone new, but he didn't want to force it. He wasn't one for one night stands, not like some of his friends who went out with a different girl every time they came down to Devon. Maybe this weekend he should start to have a look round. He thought. Not tonight, though. He wanted to wind down and get a decent night's sleep so that he could make the most of the weekend. Craig watched the waves roll in towards the shore. There would be plenty of time for pulling. He had the whole week, after all. At half past nine, there was a bang on Jenna's door. It was so loud that she jumped off the bed, her heart thumping. She realized she had fallen asleep. She did that a lot these days. Being asleep was so much better than being awake. Her mouth went dry with fear. The knock came again, even louder. She thought about pretending that she wasn't in. Oi! There was a shout from the other side of the door. She knew that voice only too well. I know you're in there. Open up. The landlord probably didn't know she was in there. He had spies everywhere. She didn't trust any of the other tenants in the house. Okay, 
she called out, and hated how weedy her voice sounded. She opened the door. The professor was standing there. They called him the professor because of his thick, black-rimmed glasses. Not because he was clever, unless you counted dripping desperate people off as clever. He was wearing a grubby white shirt, jeans and scuffed black slip-on shoes. Anyone would think he was on the breadline too. You got something for me? He wandered in as if he owned the place. Which, technically, he did, but it was her room. He should respect her privacy. Jenna swallowed hard. I'm really sorry, she stammered. My boss wouldn't pay me. I haven't got the rent money. I'll get it for you by Monday. I promise. He made a clicking noise with his tongue behind his teeth. You're already behind. I'm going to have to start charging you interest. I can't afford to pay you interest. I can't afford the rent as it is. He shrugged. It's not my problem. He walked over towards the window and looked around, then nodded. It's a big room, this. Too big for one. I could probably get a family in here. Not waste it on someone who won't pay up. He was threatening her, Jenna realized. How did he expect her to find the money? There was no point in asking him for sympathy. Men like him didn't care. How did he sleep at night, she wondered. Better than she did, probably. She looked at him, and her stomach turned. He must take in a fortune with all the money he took. What did he spend it on? He certainly didn't spend it on his clothes, or his hair which needed a good cut, not to mention a Washington. Or his car either, she'd seen him drive round in a battered old Ford Mondeo. She wondered where he lived, and if he had a wife, or any kids. She pitied them if he did. Sometimes Jenna wondered if there were any decent men in the world. He was walking towards her wardrobe, opening it up, looking through her stuff with that stupid grin on his face. Get out of my wardrobe, Jenna told him. He looked up. His hands were mauling her clothes. All the vintage dresses she'd bought in charity shops and at jumble sales and from eBay. Just seeing if there's anything I could take instead of cash. She stepped towards him. There isn't anything. I've told you. I'll get the rent money. He raised an eyebrow. Yeah? He looked her up and down. She shuddered as she felt his gaze undress her. She knew what he was thinking. She folded her arms across her chest. She didn't have to take this unspoken threat. He was a bully. Where do you get off? Treating people like this, the professor took a step back, surprised by her outburst. Like what? 
bullying them. Not just me, either. I've seen you bully that woman downstairs, the one with the baby. Does it make you feel good? He scowled, slamming the wardrobe door shut. All I want is what's owed to me. Nothing wrong with that. He came towards her with a smile. He reached out his hand and ran the back of his fingers down her cheek. His breath was stale and sour. Get me the rent. By Monday. And if I were you, I'd keep your opinions to yourself. Jenna jerked her head away. She could see that she'd rattled him. Something she'd said had touched an Irv. At least he hadn't mentioned interest. Even so, she still didn't have the rent. She hadn't got anything to sell. No jewelry, no nice watch, no computer, fancy phone or iPod. Those had all gone ages ago. At least she'd bought herself some time, though. He looked at her steadily. She could see this double starting to poke through on his chin. I'll be back first thing on Monday. She thought he was probably enjoying torturing her. It's not as if he needed the money that much. He owned several houses around the town. He must be coining in thousands a week. He could afford to wait. If she pointed out that fact, she knew what he'd say. If I let you get away with it, they'll all want to pay late. At last he left the room. Jenna hadn't thought that she was going to get rid of him that easily, but maybe he had someone else to pick on. Her landlord was scum. He wasn't the only one of his kind around, though. There were quite a few entrepreneurs in Takam who'd bought up the big old Victorian houses that has been so splendid in their heyday. Especially now the town was a run-down seaside resort filled with unemployed and disillusioned people with no hope of escape. The landlord slapped up chipboard walls and cheap kitchens and crammed in as many tenants as they could find. Jenna certainly wasn't the only person struggling. There were no decent jobs out here in the sticks. You could pick up casual work during the summer season if you were lucky, but there was slim chance of a proper career. She'd wanted to go to college but her mom had just laughed. She'd refused to support Jenna while she studied. Cheers for that, mom. She thought bitterly, though she shouldn't have been surprised. Her mom had never gone out of her way to help her with anything. Jenna had thought she'd be able to make a better life for herself on her own, but her plan had backfired big time. She was worse off now than she'd ever been. But no way was she going to go crawling back home. She knew she could just step outside and get on the bus that would take her two miles up the road to the estate where her mom lived, but she couldn't bear the thought of the look on her mom's face. Look what the cats brought in, she could hear her mother saying gleefully. Never thought Jenna.
I'm never going back there. Instead, she had to find nearly 400 quid by Monday morning, or she'd be out on the pavement surrounded by what little she had left. Her landlord, the professor, didn't make idle threats. She knew that for certain. When night had fallen, the beach was wrapped in a soft navy blue blanket spattered with stars. Craig unrolled his sleeping bag and curled up on one of the bunks in the beach hut, leaving the door slightly open. It was unlikely that anyone would try to get in, and he loved to go to sleep with the sound of the waves in the background. It was so soothing, more soothing than any lullaby. He loved the sound of the constant shushing as the tide went in and out. He checked the weather forecast on his phone before he fell asleep. Tomorrow was set fair. He'd get up early and hit the surf before anyone else. Two minutes after his head hit the pillow, Craig was asleep. Jenna was still wide awake at midnight. Her room was stifling, but if she opened her window the noise came in from outside the pub opposite. Her mind was whirling as she thought about the unfairness of the day. The full weight of being sacked was gradually beginning to hit her. Not only did she not have the money for the rent, her immediate problem, but what was she going to live on? As she closed her eyes and tried to shut out the laughter of the pub goers, her mind began to wander. What was the point of playing by the rules? It didn't seem to get you anywhere. The people she knew who'd done best in life, like the professor, didn't seem to bother. Her family had never played it straight, any of them. They were on to every scam going, and they were all as happy as Larry. If you played it straight, it seemed as if you just sank to the bottom. How was she going to get out of this trap? There would be no work going in Talkham for the rest of the summer. All the jobs were already taken. Maybe she could move to a bigger place? Bamford was the nearest big town, but she couldn't see a life for herself there. She didn't know anyone, for a start. Or a bigger city. Plymouth. Exeter? The thought of that terrified her. She'd only really known Talkham her whole life. Jenna sighed. She was stuck here. She couldn't even afford a lottery ticket. She turned onto her side and curled her legs up, tucking herself into a ball. All she could think about was the professor's face on Monday morning. She bet he was hoping she wouldn't have the money. She was sure he enjoyed kicking people out of his scuzzy rooms so that he could lure someone else in and get the deposit from them. Even if she found a job tomorrow morning, she couldn't get the money she needed in time. Nobody would pay her in advance. There were girls she knew who would know how to get that kind of money quickly. In a seaside town, there were always ways that you could supplement your income. 
Jenna wasn't going to take that path. Once you got into that, there was no way out. Anyway, the thought made her skin crawl. If she'd wanted to sell herself, she'd have made a deal with the professor already. As she felt the music from the pub pound through her body, she began to turn over possibilities in her mind. Five minutes later, Jenna sat up as an idea occurred to her. Her heart thumped. Was it crazy? It seemed so simple. Of course it was wrong, but in the grand scheme of wrong, it was way down the scale. There were far, far worse things she could do. She asked herself which was better, to be straight and penniless, or crooked and in the black, as far as money was concerned? She'd spent enough time already being the former, and it had nothing to recommend it. She'd always had a clear conscience, but you couldn't eat a strong set of moral values. The more she thought about it, the more enticing her idea became. As she went over the details and eventually drifted off to sleep, she told herself she only had to do it once, just once, until she got herself back on her feet.